Hey everybody, this is James from the Salon Movement or the Movement of Sustainable Salons. I'm here with my wife, Angela. We're from the Beehive Organic Salon in Hillsdale, New Jersey. Um, obviously, if you haven't been on a call before, my partner in crime over there in Victoria Island, BC. What's up, Curtis? Hey, James. Hey, Angela. Hi. So, and we, um, yeah, we're out from uh, Design House Salon out in uh, Vancouver Island on the West Coast. So West means East with this call. Um, we've Chantel's not going to be able to be with us um, at the beginning of the call. She might pop in later on, just depending on how she's doing. She's actually doing a bridal party down at the salon right now. So we might be able to see her in action um, a little bit later on. But yeah, excited. I love this. I love this topic. This topic's one of my faves. So Yeah. So, um, you know, if anybody hasn't caught the past two calls, this is our kickoff month. We're doing a call every Sunday and then we'll go to a little more modified schedule. Um, we titled this one you know, working on not just in your salon and we were focusing on leadership, accounting and accountability in honor of good old George Washington's birthday this week. Um, but we have some really good topics. Hopefully you have some guests that are going to be able to join us today. Um, I know in these past calls, we've bounced around a little bit and tried to cover all four of the pillars of the movement. Um, I would encourage anybody, if you haven't signed up yet, to go to the salonmovement.com and uh, definitely sign up so we can keep you informed about the cool things that we're working on with the movement of sustainable salons. Um, yeah, but, uh, you know, I probably want to start a little bit and give everybody a, a quick and, and dirty version of Blab. So these calls are done by a website called blab.im. It's available on iOS. Um, you definitely need to use a Firefox or Chrome browser. But as you can see, there's a couple little things here. You see this mute button. So if anybody's able to jump on the call and you have some background chatter or something you want to mute out, um, definitely hit that. You can see these little props hands there. So uh, definitely feel free to give Curtis and I props anytime you feel like it, or if there's something you really like that we talk about, uh, thank you, Nicole. Um, <laughs> you know, it's, uh, if anything, anything happens from a quality control perspective on the call, the easiest thing to do is to go to that top little refresh in your browser window and refresh. Um, or if, uh, everything is kind of failing, you can jump onto the salonmovement.com slash live, and you'll able to catch the live call and some of our past recorded calls. But, uh, Curtis, why don't you give everybody a, a quick and uh, easy version about the movement itself? Yeah, sure. So um, anybody that doesn't know what this is all about, which I'm probably sure you are, unless it's uh, just a casual, you know, you're just coming on Blab just to see what's happening. Um, this is uh, the movement of Sustainable Salons, and it's a uh, initiative by um, myself and James and Angela and Chantel uh, for moved by Davinus uh, in response for... <clears throat> really just having a, a really cool grassroots movement towards sustainability. Uh, we don't put ourselves out there as being um, business development experts. Um, we own our own salons. We try to do the best we can. Sometimes we, you know, win, sometimes we lose, but uh, it's all about just coming together and giving a few ideas, being able to work together to be able to, for our own cooperative success and, this is a great opportunity for salons out there to be able to, you know, promote yourself, promote who you are, what you're doing, what you're passionate about. Um, as far as Blab itself is concerned, I really love it because it's just, it's, it's very organic and, and it really matches what we're trying to do with the salon movement. It's not high production. It's, it's going to be, you know, low production, low effort. Um, come on, give us some really um, great content. We'll put it out there and then you can uh, access us at any time. If um, there's any salons that are in the house that, um, you know, that that um, are part of the movement, that are a Davina salon or a Davina stylist out there that hasn't joined yet, go to the salonmovement.com and join. Um, put your put your credentials over on the side, over on the right. There's a place where you can put messages. Just put your name and your salon and everything else, and we can unlock our seats down below, and you can join in for the call, and uh, you get an opportunity to promote your salon. I want to give a quick shout out to some of the new members this week for the Salon Movement. We've got a number of them, but um, just the last week or so, we've got uh, Lisa Crane from Platform Color Style and Salon out in San Dimas, Cali. We've got uh, Hub Esink uh, from Hair Plaza in the Netherlands. Uh, we've got my boy, Kevin Delman, out in Mafio Salon and just north of us up in Nanaimo. And uh, Krista Victory from Montage Salon, Lancaster, Cali. Um, and uh, Drake Pan from D Culture Salon out in Cal Calgary. <laughs> Instead of Cali, Calgary, awesome. Alberta. 
So that can awesome, be awesome. Anyway. That's that's great. Welcome aboard, guys. I uh, definitely want to shout out to our staff too. They've been awesome in jumping on all these calls the past three weeks. So, hey, ladies, uh, Thanks, see you all inside. Thanks, guys. Um, I guess the easiest way we'll, we'll tackle the easiest. I mean, the hardest, but the easiest one to go over. Um, but we'll, we'll start it with accounting. I know this time of year, obviously, the year's ended, and um, you know you're getting ready to do your your final tax numbers and things with your various states and places that you're located. Um, it's obviously a difficult time because you know you just come off the high of the the holidays, and you know most salons, I would assume, um, have an awesome December, hopefully, and. You, know, you may come in and limp into January a bit. I know. Um, I know. In our case, obviously, planning for the worldwide hair tour in January, um, it actually made us busier because we were away for a few days in between. Um, but the accounting component is just a real pain in the neck. I mean, um, most salon owners, you know, obviously working in, um, not on your salon, are behind the chair, and it's just you know whether you have a bookkeeper or you're trying to do your own books. Um, it's just really hard. And I would probably be the first one to say, don't do it. Like, do not do not do your own books. Um, it's worth it just to have that buffer in case you do get audited or something happens. Um, it should be an expense that is incorporated into your, your budget and your planning. But, but hire an accountant and, and work with somebody that's going to handle your books for you. Um, you know, in our salon, we use QuickBooks. Uh, we had a big problem initially because most accountants like Windows. We're a Mac-based shop. And um, it was just brutal with the transferring of files and things. And finally, we just jumped into QuickBooks Online and now they can log in. Um, you know, we can reconcile our books and we can communicate through the software. It's all digital, which is super great. Um, you know, and it downloads direct from our bank. So I'm not advocating QuickBooks. Um, I think the original software was kind of buggy, but we really got hit with the online version now. What, what are you guys using at Design House, Curtis? Yeah, so we're just doing a switch over right now. We switched our accountants and bookkeepers over t and just recently. The um, the system that we're on is uh, it's called MindBody, and it does have a QuickBooks um, portion uh, for you know collaboration with that. To tell you the truth, that that's one of the last things I really want to have to deal with. So that's I guess I'll maybe go into some of my points here. You know, you became a hairstylist because you love you know, what you do and you're passionate about it. And you might be able to do your own books. But I just wanna encourage people to say that, you know what, the things that you don't like to do or the things that are really important for your, for your business, you know, go out and hire consultants. It's, you know, people are passionate and really good about certain areas of their business. And bookkeepers and accountants, they're part of your team. You can hire them. They're going to be able to give you a third party perspective of what's going on in your, in, you know, in your business. And um, I just say hands down is the best option. So you know what we do? We have our accountants and, and bookkeepers dealing with that. So they're going to develop the system that is best for them to be able to respond to our business needs. And uh, we have them connected with everybody that we deal with, including our banker, our, our um, profit consultant, um, our front desk uh, client experience coordinator. And, you know, from my perspective, doing the marketing promotions in the salon, because that's what I love to do. And then Chantel right from down to the operational end, you know, hands on in the business working. And that it seems to be working out for us uh, that way. Things come up, but, um, you know, at least at least you have those professionals and you can keep people accountable um, outside of just your own self for things to happen. Yeah, I think that's a great point. Um... You know, we're, we're lucky, obviously, with the project and we're Curtis and I are becoming um, friendly with some outside resources and people that are industry experts and, and people that we've consulted with before. Um, one of them being Neil Duqua from Strategies, which is located here in the States in Connecticut. Um, they do a, a bunch of different things. They do an incubator program and it's really designed for salon owners to take a hard look at their numbers. Um, one of the crazy things they do as part of this training is they do an exit strategy. Because, you know, I guess some salons open and all they do is decline all the way down and then they get to the end and they've been open 10 years. If they were, if they didn't make money, there's no value to the business. So they try to do that front loaded so you, know, you can build your brand and build your value. So at some point when you said, hey, I had a great career, I've been doing it for 40 years and I'm done and I want to retire. Um, they do an awesome job with kind of coming up with a retirement plan almost for salon owners, which is beautiful. Um, but Neil is going to actually be on one of the calls with us um, in the near future, and we'll kind of dedicate it to looking at those numbers specifically. 
Um, he was able to share some things with Curtis and I um, in terms of numbers and things that we should be looking at. He is also going to do something really cool for us that one of the salon owners on the call today um, definitely sign up for the movement and he's going to donate one of his awesome books. It's called Fast Forward. Um, funny thing about it is he wrote it, I want to say, 25 years ago for the salon industry and just did an update like three years ago that it was so appropriate all these years. And the only real change he did was to change some things in terms of social media, which um, hopefully we get a call on at some point. We'll do a little touch on social media itself and how it helps you work um, on your business, not in your business. But there's a couple of really crazy stats that he has. And this is really for the stylists that are on the call and how retail is such an important component. So, you know, no matter what your percentage is or if your service charge, depending on area or how your structure is for your salon, um, it, it's just, you know, if you came in, so a seasoned stylist comes in and says, hey, I have a full book of clients and they want to command 70%. Um, you know, the theme of the movement is about sustainability overall. There's no way to sustain that. There's just not enough in terms of what you're paying out, in terms of rent, in terms of support staff, um, you know, lights and utilities and all the basic things that you definitely need to stay open and sustainable. So it's something for the stylist on the call to think about when you may be in your next meetings with your owners and things. And, um, you know, the, the owner's complaint always is that expenses are too high and stylists are always looking to, to command more of that dollar that comes in. But reality of it is, if you could get your salon to where it's more productive and you could be booked smarter, not harder, um, I think it's really important that from the owner on down through the staff in terms of the training is being able to look at it and say, hey, how can we streamline this and, and make it something that works? What do you think, Curtis? Yeah, well, I, I would definitely, you know, I really advocate looking outside the box for different resources out there and everybody's going to resonate with different things that are out there for business development and strategies and consultants. But I think the, the main idea is that people are taking a look and you know, it's, it's beyond just saying, you know what, I'm going to go in and cut hair and I cut hair really, really well. And the business is just going to take care of itself because unfortunately it doesn't. And then it can potentially, you know, ruin people's passions for the industries of being, you know, really what they got in, in it, um, for the first place. And, you know, it's, I, I think it's really important. I think, especially even from a, a stylist owner perspective, like, you know, we've got a, a unique circumstance in that, you know, you and I, James are, are, um, aren't hairstylists, but, you know, Angela, you are behind the chair every day, operationally in the salon all the time. Chantel is the same way. So, you know, we're a unique perspective because we can, we can kind of be behind, behind the chair um, in a way where we can look at it from a third party perspective, where sometimes a stylist right behind their client can't always look that, you know, that same way, uh, far ahead. And is that something that, you know, kind of resonates, you know, with you guys with regards to, you know, your unique circumstance, I, I feel like, you know, for stylists out there or salon owners that may not, you know, they may be in their business so much that uh, to, to kind of take a step back and, and look at it, it's, it can be difficult and overwhelming. Um, yeah, is, is, is there anything you want to add about that for your guys' experience? Well, I, I find it very difficult to work on my business because um, when I'm there, I'm completely consumed with my clientele and I'm very grateful to be that busy and to help my staff on the floor sort of navigate different things, problems with clients and whatnot. But having... Having that busy time in the salon and then coming home to three kids, there really is no time for me in my brain to work on my business. And I feel very lucky that we have the scenario like you guys do where he's doing a lot of that. We have an issue in our salon right now where because we're only open, you know, four years, he's taken on not only all of that, but the front end. And he is, you know, taking in clients and checking them out and talking about products and he's awesome at it, but it's time, it's time now that we delegate some of that to somebody else so that we're, we're in the salon working on our business so that when we leave the salon, we leave the salon and we have some time to be with our kids, decompress, not have, you know, it's like working 24 seven and that's, it's great, but it's, you know, at some point you have to sort of say, we're at this growth, we're, we're here. 
So now we have to move to the next level. And I think that's a really hard thing to do. I stopped working Tuesdays behind my chair and I go in and I do training and different things like that. And even then, when I can be the one that intakes clients, he doesn't let me because he, he's got this hold on it and he does it a certain way. And he's afraid to allow anybody else to do it because he doesn't he knows nobody's going to do it as good as him, even though I have the same investment that he does in the business. It's hard. You know, the same as it's hard for me to not be behind the chair while I'm in my salon because that's what I do best. And that's what I love. So it's. Well, well do you imagine, uh, you know, James learning to do hair and then having to go behind your clients and be like, yeah, no, I'm, this is this James, my husband, he's going to take you over now. Um, yeah, no. Although he thinks he can, uh, you know, I don't know. I it's always tell them they should be afraid if I ever got licensed because <laughs> it's a uh, dynamic, you know, it, it's funny that, you look at the dynamics of the salon industry together and how things work. And, you know, we're in the process of training a few assistants and things like that and, and getting them integrated. We have one of our, our, our lead assistant is now getting her first chair. So the perspective, um, we're really fortunate because we have this great perspective of like how that growth happens over, over time. And, you know, it's difficult. I mean, that's, that's something that we're going to put on in terms of, you know, training from behind the sink, um, I'm one of these calls specifically as well, because it's important. I feel like, you know, they, um, you know, something we had talked about is they get out of beauty school and, you know, they get licensed and all they're learning are, you know, basic techniques and how to pass the test and how to do perms, which, you know, we still do two perms a year, but that's it. Um, and, and they're not really learning anything in terms of the front end, in terms of doing consultations with clients, um, not even just the technical aspect. They're just not learning anything in terms of the day-to-day -day of operating behind their own chair. And, uh, and, it, and it's difficult. And I think that that's, you know, that's where the accountability standpoint plays in, which is another topic of the call today. Um, you know, owners, and even if you're a salon suite, which I know a lot of our California uh, movement crew, because you had seen us out at the uh, Worldwide Hair Tour, most of you are gonna be, uh, or a good percentage are gonna be salon suite owners or, you know, you know something in booth between. Renters. Booth we, renters, we don't have that in New Jersey. Um, but yeah. So, but it's, you, you look at it from the accountability standpoint, you're accountable to your clients and your staff in so many different ways. And, um, you know, I don't know, what do you, what do you think about that in terms of the accountability standpoint as, as the owner, as somebody, as a stylist? So well, I think it's really, it, that's another hard thing is when you're training younger staff and trying to give them, you know, all the knowledge they need to then finally get behind the chair and then to have, you know, a new client come in and say, Oh, okay. Should I give that to them? Like, you know, he he hears a problem client and wants to automatically give it to me because I'm invested in it. I know I'm going to do a good job. It's it's my baby. I you know, but you have to be able to trust your staff and train them enough that, you know, allow them to be accountable for what happens behind their chair. And it's a hard thing to do. I think um, I, we have a great staff, but it, it's it's on me. I'm accountable for how well they do their job and for how, how consistent they are and for how well they're trained before they get behind the chair. And I try to do my best and I've learned with each person I've moved up, um, learned from my mistakes, so to speak, but it's, it's a, it's a big responsibility. I take it as a very huge responsibility to train them and to then give them, you know, their wings and say, okay, now go for it. And I'm always there, you know, to back them up, but it's still, it's, it's, it's difficult. I know. And I don't know. I wish Chantel was on the call because I don't know how beauty school is for you guys in Canada, and it's different for us from state to state. I'm licensed in both New York and New Jersey, and I, it was a long time ago that I went to beauty school, but I can tell you it hasn't changed much. Some of the testing I know in New York hasn't been revised since like the 1950s. It's really, it's really sad that these girls come out, they're licensed, they can technically cut hair, and some places will actually hire them right off, right out of beauty school to do so. And they know nothing. You know, they don't even know how to do a proper shampoo. So there's no support on that end from the licensing aspect to help us help them. I don't, I don't know how many hours. You, do you guys have a certain amount of hours that you have to do? Or do you know that? Yeah, there is a certain amount of hours. I don't know exactly the amount. But, um, you know, for our, for our particular jurisdiction for hair, so British Columbia being the province, <clears throat> um, there's it's even worse because there's actually no regulation um hair wow. industry is completely deregulated so um you do not need a license to cut hair you wow. do not need training to cut hair 
you can literally walk into a salon and start doing all those services legally without any training. So you can imagine, you know, like the quality control from a, a you know, a customer or a client perspective, walking into a salon that's, you know, just a, a whatever uh, place, they literally, the people that are there do not have to have any training whatsoever. Wow. So it's, it's, it, you know, blows everybody's minds that are it's in. Scary. Habit. It's, it's downright scary. <laughs> it is. So obviously we don't hire people that are, un, that are not trained, but the people that we do hire that are trained, I agree. There's only certain programs that we really are comfortable with from hiring people from that we know that at least has some fundamentals, but you know, they, the people that we hire after two years of, of it's usually about two years of training and experience that they have in, in, in school, maybe a year and a half. Um, when they come back out, then they pretty much work about eight to months to a year in the salon right. you know, apprenticing before they're, they're considered even a junior stylist um, to start doing, you know, actually taking their own clients. So we're, yeah, it's, 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 it's quite a bit different. Yeah. Uh, and I think everybody everywhere in the, in the world will probably have different scenarios with regards to, you know, the challenges that they have for training. But what really, when it comes down to it is that, you know, you do need to find out for yourself where that, that, that development piece is in your salon to be able to say, now I am comfortable with that for them to be taking clients and I need to trust them. And for that, it's going to be different for every salon owner, but. I think it's really important to, be backed by a company that helps the salon owner create, like I created my own fundamental course for my staff and I went through my own training and, and how I was taught. And I went back through Vidal Sassoon's ABC courses and Tony and guys classic cutting courses and just sort of studied so I could teach myself how to teach, you know, my staff, but it would be really great if, I know Davinus, we go to plenty of their advanced cutting classes, but for them to have like a real core foundational training program would be something that for Davinus salon owners would be, I think for me, it would be so helpful. Not that even to send them to that class, but to send the owner to that class, like a train the trainer um, so that you could, because it's, it's a lot different knowing the fundamentals than teaching the fundamentals. So and those don't change. The rules are the rules. And then you can break them after you've learned all of them. But I feel like I wish that um, maybe Amy could have come on the call, Amy Myers, so that she could, you know, we could give her that advice. Because I think that's something that would, would take Davines as a company to like another another level in terms of supporting their salons. Well, they're they're definitely listening to us. So uh, <laughs> I'm sure I'm sure they got the message. <laughs> You know, they, to give them some credit, I suppose that they have made some strategic partnerships with um, with uh, Sassoon Academies to be able to, yes. you know, have um, a program that they, they say, you know, this is an academy that we, we sponsor and that Sassoon does give a discount toward to, to Davina salons and stylists that um, that want to take their programs. So that's yeah. good. We did that last winter and cool. um, I, I definitely suggest if, if anyone – has access to those classes that they do go. Um, they're very good. They're, uh, we took, we did a two day, um, with most of my staff and it was really, it was really helpful. And I think I, it was helpful to me, not that I didn't know that, but I used it. I went with a different perspective in mind to try and learn and take something from them and how they taught it. And I think it really helped. So if, if you guys had the opportunity to go to one of those classes for sure, take advantage of it. Yeah, and I think um, it's probably worth noting too that Curtis mentioned that partnership with uh, with Sassoon Academies. Um, the discount is actually great for Davina Salons. You have to, um, it's not a lot of hoops to jump through. You just, I guess they basically contact, you know, maybe they contact Ayla Cobb, the education manager for Davina or someone um, in DNA and, and say, hey, you know, is this a salon that works with you guys? But I want to say the discount might have been 20% or, or somewhere even a little bit better than that. Um, and what's really crazy is that they um, they actually give you the discount on the tools as well. So Sassoon is very particular in the types of brushes and combs and things that they require you to have as part of the training classes. Um, but if you're, you know, they have access to a lot of things. So you actually get the discount across the board, which was fantastic. I mean, that's, you know, to be able to get it every every which way is really nice. Um, but that's something, you know, that's something we'll we'll... 
you know, as we move these calls throughout, we'll do super specific topics like education. Um, I know Curtis and I talked about it a little bit, hopefully for next month at some point uh, with the anniversary of the new essentials release that had come out with the slow food ingredients. Uh, we hope to get um, somebody from Slow Food USA on a call with us to talk a little bit about the importance of slow food and what they do and, and things like that. So there's a lot of really good things. And hopefully we can tie that back into the education behind the sink because you know, from our end, we find that that adds to the beauty of the products that Douglas makes. So, you know, the food grade plastic and the zero impact and those things, those are things super important to our clientele because they come to us because we're based around it. But for some of the other salons that carry Davines, um, that like the performance of the line and, and like the way they're priced or the way they look, I feel like you're missing a whole opportunity on some of the other beautiful things about the line itself in terms of the sustainable aspects and what they do. So hopefully in the grand scheme of the movement, that's one thing we can enlighten you guys on uh, because I feel like even Design House between us, every time we have a talk about products, we do a lot of things similar and, and our clients, there's always that resonating theme of what the clients really like. Um, but I think that's something that we definitely be able to share with you guys. And we hope that that's something that is a good takeaway, whether you're a you know, booth renter or, or a salon owner. Yeah, that's a good point because definitely education is going to be a uh, subject to a call, um, especially when we have the opportunity to have um, the guys from ION on with us uh, to talk a little bit about, you know, um, advanced education for stylists. Uh, we could maybe do an, an advanced education potential for Davinus stylists out there and just uh, feature some people. And I think that would be a really good, good message. Um, one note I'll make just with regards to kind of as like a disclaimer or whatever for us, um, with regards to our sustainability partners with the movement, um, just so everybody knows that we're gonna, we are gonna feature, you know, partners and sustainable partners um, in the movement itself. Um, they don't necessarily constitute a you know, direct and formal, um, you know, Davenous support, you know, aspect to it. Um, that we're Davenous themselves is not endorsing any particular product other than new, our, our system or other person. Um, some of these are, are going to be on our own um, resources just um, because, you know, this is the important part. So we'll, we'll feature some of those on the website itself. So there'll be a, a section for sustainable partners. And we've got um, one of those partners um, on the call today that we're going to hopefully hear from in a little while with regards to some social media uh, things that uh, we talked about last week. That was a great call. Thank you guys so much for, for being part of that one. It was a, it was a really, it was a really good exercise. And I hope that um, it really, as the playbacks and replays happen, that people get really good traction with some of that content that we've put out there. Um, and I know that, you know, like when we're talking about accountability and working on our business, if we get back into that topic, um, James, I know you had some statistics um, from, from the strategy system, from Neil's perspective, which I think is really important just to kind of get uh, a baseline here. Um, like we said, we're not particularly endorsing any particular system itself, but you know, baselines I think are really important. Yeah, and you know, the the stats, the numbers don't lie. And that's something that, you know, any good accountant will tell you. The numbers are the numbers, they exist, they're there. Um, it's just a matter of, you know, looking at something, is it, is it an investment or is it an expense? Uh, so even from the individual stylist standpoint or, or even from your client's end, you know, an inferior tool is an expense. It's not an investment. So you'll always find no matter what the maker model, but your your better higher end master stylist types are always going to have the best brushes, blow dryers, scissors on the market because they're looking at them that they're an investment, um, not just in the in their craft that they're doing and, and their work womanship or menship. Um, but reality of it is, is the same thing resonates with clients. You know, you buy a $20 blow dryer from the drugstore, you're going to get a $20 blow dry. Mm -hmm. um, it's also not going to last as long. So, you know, in terms of those kind of things, those are, you know, even when you get to your profit and loss statements and things and looking at them, you know, what are expenses, what are investments for future for the salon for growth? Um, you know, one of the awesome things about Neil and strategies and um, I was really lucky. I've met Neil a few times. I was at, um, at a seminar that he did for probably about a hundred other salon owners. And they were the view from my seat for what the other salon owners were looking at from the numbers were crazy. You know, I feel like we have a lot of different things in place in terms of how we monitor numbers and things. 
Um, I don't know if it's some of it because of our dynamic, just like you, um, or if it's just that we're newer, so we're, you know, minding our pennies to, to see how the dollars grow. But, you know, reality of it is some of these salon owners and, you know, their retail sales numbers are what they are and, um, you know, their their growth and, and their net profit, their jaws were like on the floor. I mean, they, they could have had somebody there um, just to help pick up mouths from what Neil was saying. And I, I didn't think any of it was so mind blowing because it's things that we do. So I don't want to take that for granted. And I think that you guys should look at, you know, um, you know, like service payroll. So your your commission, if your commissions, um, you know, even if you're a booth register, some of these things will be applicable, but um, it should be 30 to 35 percent of your gross revenue. And that gross revenue is everything. So it's service plus retail sales. Um, that's why if you're a stylist that is seasoned enough to command a higher commission rate, the retail numbers still apply to you. Those retail numbers, it's, um, I don't want to ever say it's found money for the salon. It's definitely something that we feel ties right back into your retention and your rebooking rates and, um, and things like that. But, you know, you really need to look at those numbers because that helps to offset so many other things. So, you know, the busy, the busiest stylist in the salon that doesn't have any ownership stake, if you don't have assistance to help you at the sink, if you don't have a you know, rock star grade front desk, you don't have um, great products or you know, refreshments for the clients, you probably wouldn't be able to, to have the luxury of being so booked. So sometimes, you know, you know, from the accountability standpoint, tying back into the numbers, you know, those are things that your owners are looking at. So, you know, this time of year, if you're a stylist and you see your owner stressed, you know, maybe you should look at it from their perspective a little bit too, in terms of, you know, where they are in, in the numbers game. Um, things like rent. Um, I know you guys out on the island, your rent probably is higher than it would be somewhere in the middle of the U.S. But, you know, your rent should be six to eight percent of your gross revenue. Anything outside of that, I know we have some, um, you know, when we were going to open, we looked at walking downtowns as our model. And a lot of them, some of them were just criminal what they charge per square foot. I mean, you know, if you charge near Manhattan prices because we're not so far away and you're going to be $100 a square foot or in some cases $200 a square foot, you better hope that that amplifies what your haircut prices or what your hair color prices, right? Yeah, of course. You know, it's always going to be appropriate based on those things. So I think those are some, you know, some important things. One thing Neil had offered to anybody that signed up for the movement, uh, any of you owners out there, booth renters or otherwise, um, he offered a complimentary call to kind of go over some of those baseline numbers. Um, I know he uses some different reports from the salon software. Mm -hmm. I don't know the, the specific mind body report, but I know with millennium, it's an MA 100, I believe report. That's sort of a modified version of a PNL. Um, but you know, those are some of the things that he had offered to us to, to be able to help and, and kind of give some guidance and advice. Um, some of the other things that you guys need to look at too, um, he, jokingly, when Neil and I spoke yesterday, he said, this one always gets a good laugh, but for you owners out there, um, to have four months of cash reserves, um, you know, in the bank to, to be able to support, um, just your operational costs, um, you know, that's it. you you may hit a rough month. I mean, location wise, um, obviously from the sustainable aspect, we're believers in global warming to some degree. Um, you know, you get a hurricane that rolls through and, you don't have the funding to, to help do any rebuild or the insurances and the basics in place. And you're basically out of business. I mean, I hate to say it, but, um, but it's really tough. Anything, um, anything else I know, even from our end, you know, you'd like to have some type of net profit in a 10 to 20% margin. I think that's something that applies to any business, not just the salon industry. Um, but you have to look at owner salaries too. Like if you're an owner that does not, work behind the chair, or if you are an owner, um, you know, you want to make sure that that investment versus expense applies to you as well in terms of growth for your salon. What, what about any numbers with your end of the year, Curtis, anything, you know, number wise that you looked at that you were surprised in a good or bad way? Um, well, I mean, <laughs> yeah, that's, I mean, the thing we're, we're coming on just four years um, being in business. And so it has taken us um, a little while to become profitable. I was surprised that, you know, in the numbers perspective, um, um, I don't think you mentioned it, but, um, but you know, it, I'm really surprised that only 
of salons out there are profitable. You know, that's the, that's the, the statistic. And um, also for, you know, retail to service dollars. So if you take your service totals, you, or sorry, you take your retail totals and you divide it by your service totals, that most salons out there are only at 4% RTS. And so if you look at that combination of, you know, how important retail sales are um, to, to, a, uh, to a business, you're looking at, you know, four, you know, eight, 10% of salons out there are profitable and, and yet the average is at 4% RTS. If you look at salons that are 22, 25% RTS, 80% of those salons are profitable. Right. Yeah. So that's, I mean, that's a telltale sign right there that, you know, it's not a hundred percent that if you sell product that you're going to be profitable salon and profitable, meaning, you know, that that's a, that's a personal corporate thing that you want to look at. But um, even from a stylist perspective of, of profitability, meaning that, you know, you're, you're working smarter, not harder, not having to con the constantly attract new clientele that you're retaining your clientele, your retention boosts up. If you sell three products in one service, your, your, your retention on that client goes up to 85%. It's, it's unreal, you know, the, the correlation between products sold and, and really the authentic um, following that people will have for their hair salon consultant, uh, you know, professional, hair, hairstyles professional. And it is a lot about trust, I think. And, you know, these are, these are kind of fun ways, you know, the, well, the, the percentages are terrible. If you think about it, I guess <laughs> people are like, oh, my goodness, like how are salons? There's a lot of salons out there. Right. Like there's a lot, but, um, you know, a lot of them aren't, aren't profitable, but I think that from a, a salon owner or stylist perspective, looking at this from a sustainability point of view, it's really important to at least just acknowledge just at the smallest point, just acknowledge that, you know, you need to look at this or, you know, a need is maybe a, a tough way to say it. you should in a way, you know, be thinking that as a business owner, that these these statistics, these numbers are really important and you need to pay attention to them. Um, take, take the time when you're not behind the chair to set yourself up for success, to be able to look at these things, not just at the end of the year. Um, from our perspective, we actually do a sales um, for, and forecast. So we, we break it down. Um, I, won't, I probably can't look too much into it because you'll actually see our numbers anyways, but the... <laughs> We, we break them down into um, cost centers. And so what we do is, you know, we look at all of, um, you know, our cost of sales, the expenses, um, and we break them down into, you know, like accounting, advertising, amortization, bank charges, donations, insurance, licensing, you know, professional development, management, like all these, you know, office repairs, all this stuff. So we actually know, you know, we're, we're forecasting ahead of time and per month and quarters, you know, exactly what, these things should be costing us. So at the end of the month, we know that when we actually post the actual numbers, we can see, oh, wait a second, we're like, you know, we're over on our um, advertising by, you know, 20%. Why? You still look at it like, well, we, we got involved with this and we got involved with this. And we're like, oh, okay, great. So, you know, we should look at it and say, well, we got 20% more advertising. So maybe over the next couple of months, we probably should see a 20% increase in sales. Otherwise, you know, that advertising might not have actually paid off. Right. Um, and I know you don't need to have a direct, you know, ROI, a return on investment, on, like in that sense, but at least it gets you starting to think through this kind of stuff to be able to say, you know, like these numbers are important. They do make sense. And then it allows you to post um, your percentage increases, which you're expecting, you know, 15, 20% increase in your business over that time to be able to say, you know what, I'm not just getting by, you know, I'm not just getting, you know, cause just to an inflation alone, you're losing 3% a year if you're just staying even. Yeah. And that's something, you know, it's, um, and that's, I guess that's the, the real point of it is you have to look at these numbers. You can't, you can't hide them. It's, it's great that not only does design house look at the numbers, but they forecast. Um, but it kind of all ties back in because the, you know, the symbiotic relationship between these numbers and these percentages, like Curtis said, so you spend a little more on advertising, you expect to see an uptick in some of those other numbers, which would make sense. And or otherwise the advertising didn't work. But, you know, when you look at everything as a whole, if retail rebooking and things are all kind of commingled together, 
it, it may afford your business or the company you work for to spend less on advertising, which means that there's an influx of cash, not in the owner's pocket, but in terms of being able to do an education event or, or bring, you know, maybe one of the Davinus headliners in like a, like Joseph DiMaggio or somebody into your salon to do a class because you don't have that same spend as other salons. I mean, you know, there's, it's really hard to advertise. Print advertising is tough. It depends on area. Um, you know, with um, obviously the having Nicole on and hopefully she jumps on at some point soon with the social media, you look at the changes in Facebook advertising. I, I don't cry about the Facebook changes because to boost the post for $5, I think is uh, way better than a 2000 or $3,000 ad in one of our local upright glossy magazines. Um, but it's a matter of just taking a look at them. One really interesting thing that I took from, um, from Neil's seminar, and hopefully when we get him on a one-on-one -on -one call here, he'll talk about it. And this is something that all of you owners should do, like whatever, if you go back in tomorrow or you go back in Tuesday, is add happiness as a service into your software. So no matter what your software is, they're gonna allow you to kind of edit and add on um, you know, another service. So whether it was gonna be a, some modified highlight or something, there's, there's ways to do it, but add happiness and, and coach your front desk to say, if a client checks out and they rebook and they buy product, that you add happiness to their service ticket. So uh, we do email receipts. And when we started to do that, it was sort of a joke. And I had a few clients call and say, you know, um, I got my receipt and there was happiness on it. And it's like, oh yeah, happiness is free here. Like we, there was no charge for happiness today. But when you go back in, because we're so limited in what the software lets us look at, it's a great way for you to be able to look at that particular number in terms of retention and product purchasing without having MindBody or, or Millennium create a whole new report just for you. Um, and, and you'd be really surprised how many, you know, you look at, hey, we had 400 appointments this month and we had happiness on 200. That's, you know, some of those numbers um, are awesome to take a look at. And, and it's good and it's mm -hmm. empowering for your staff to know that the correlation between them behind the chair and the front desk and the product, it, it's all working together in unison. Yeah. Just going back to the retail for a second, I feel like we are extremely lucky to be connected and to be part of the Davines family because these aren't products that you get in CVS or ShopRite or Whole Foods or anything like that. So I think that clients really feel like they really can only get them from you and they're special and they're not diverted. And I, I feel like it's so much easier to sell something that that has that kind of quality behind it um besides the fact that they're wonderful products that that factor i can't tell you how many years i worked in a salon that sold plenty other name products and they were like well i know if i go to Harmon, i can get it for two dollars cheaper and it was almost impossible to sell retail there because all the stuff that was on their shelves were you know in the supermarket so I feel like, you know, we should definitely be grateful and lucky that we are part of a company that really stands behind that. And, um, you know, yeah. it makes it a lot easier. Yeah. Thanks for saying that, Angela, because, you know, you're right. Um, we're not just we're not just saying that we have to sell a product and that's just what it is and that there's no ethics or there's no content behind it. There is an amazing uh, product that people um, can sell and that it's it's not just selling them something that they don't need because that's not authentic um, They're actually selling them something that they do need and that you're excited about and we've had it's unreal We've had search. I love getting new staff into our into the mix with us because we just did a We had Jess uh, from West Coast Beauty who is the uh, Davenis, um, uh Coordinator for the for well it was for the Western region, but now it's just for I believe British Columbia um, she came in and did a little bit of um, professional development with us and we had one of our styles say, you know, the last thing she ever liked to do in salons was sell product because she actually really, not that she doesn't like selling, she likes selling, she thinks that's important, but she just didn't really like, didn't really feel that the products that they carried were much different. You know, they were important, but they weren't really much different than what they could get anywhere else. So, you know, to be with with Davinus and to say like, you know, the actual, you know, quality matches the value proposition is really important. And I think that's, yeah, that's, that's an amazing opportunity for, for salons and, you know, for accountability wise, when it was getting back to, you know, really looking at these numbers and, and looking at it, um, selling product is, is one, um, even just selling services and quantity numbers. Um, it's really important to, to look at and break it down 
Oh, yeah, well, I guess I shouldn't even really be showing this because it's not even, but you can't see it anyways, but um, you can break all your revenue streams down into separate sections. And I think what I can do is I'll try to black out some of these numbers or get a, a, a template and we'll can post it on the website or in thing to be able to show, you know, what you can start looking at for breaking down your own salon into percentages. This is something that we spent a lot of money on um, getting one of our contractors to do for us as a, one of our business partners to be able to look at, but, you know, to be able to actually break it down by units so that you know that, you know, not just by dollar amounts, because you could be getting up in the same area for, you know, for, for percentage on the amount, but if you're selling less of something by quantity, so the number itself, so like 40 haircuts as opposed to, you know, 100 haircuts, you know, that can mean a big difference. Oh, hey, Nicole. Hi. Hi. Welcome. Hi, I Nicole was thinking I should Paradox have more with my hair because I'm talking to salon owners. <laughs> well, I think you did a pretty good job. <laughs> Nicole is one of our... Uh, well, I guess we I've, I've actually never met you personally, but you're going to be coming to the salon on Tuesday yeah. and then we're going to go for coffee afterwards. Um, you're on one of our other calls. Um, it's called Whiskey Fridays with uh, with Joe. Yeah. And uh, we do some business development and talk some uh, do some really cool stuff on that with sales development. And I, I recommend everybody to check that out for uh, some sales. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I've always, I've always admired, you know, what you have to bring to the table with regards to what your passion is, which is uh, social media and working with small businesses to be able to just communicate their awesomeness to their clients and to potential clients. So um, we didn't, we were able to have you on the call last week. We were talking about follow, liking and sharing, yeah. sharing the love. Um, but maybe um, now that we're talking about accountability and accounting and working on your business rather than just in your business, do you have some, some, you know, oh, tips there's so for many things I want to say. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Listening to what you guys are talking about. Uh, can you hear me? Okay. Yeah. It sounds okay. perfect. Perfect. So um, there are so many points that you've brought up that I just think are awesome. And even just watching the blab um, and noticing, cause on the right hand side, you can see that there's the column with comments and, uh, the engagement, the welcoming of people when they're coming onto your show, just how important that in itself can be because a lot of people don't realize that their brand isn't just a logo. It's the whole customer experience. It's when I call your salon. It's when I see you out in the street and say, hi, are you going to, you know, it's the brand is so much more than just visual um, logo. It's, it's, it's so much more. So seeing how you guys are interacting, how you guys are, providing education, you know, it's really awesome. And that really helps um, potential clients to see um, exactly how passionate you are about your business. And then you're, I'm assuming I'm going to see that in your salon on Tuesday and that for everybody on the show, who's, you know, passionate about what they're doing, that when they go into the salon, they're going to feel it and go, wow, this was actually a great experience from the moment I called to the moment I left to a follow-up email you know, that is, that is what makes a brand and that's what makes people talk about you. Um, the accountability, um, as well, when people write or are, are writing reviews or when, um, you're asking for recommendations, going out of your way to actually respond to those reviews and recommendations is so important and not enough people do it. And it's funny because you, all of these things you think are really obvious, right? Like if I write a review on Facebook for you that you're going to engage with me, that you're either going to like it or write a comment about how you were happy that I had such a great experience or that I liked the product or whatever it was. And a lot of people aren't doing it. So if I go out of my way to write a recommendation or a review for you, that's gonna be um, basically advertising for you 24 seven. Even when you're not working, that review and recommendation is working for you. And the fact that you can't acknowledge that I did that is kind of disappointing. So even taking that small step to just acknowledge that someone's gone out of their way is so helpful. Especially since most like 80% or more of people right now are looking for reviews and that social proof before they actually decide to um, do business with you. So I think that's really important and you have to be accountable for your actions. And if you're going to ask for those reviews and recommendations, then you have to put that time in to thank people for them. Otherwise, don't ask them for it.
That's a good, that's a really good point on Nicole is that, you know, that is it is reviews are on interaction and to acknowledge people that are that invested in your success, that they're going to go out of their way to be able to, you know, you know, give you some feedback, positive or negative, um, is a really an amazing opportunity to really get and engage with a person that's part of your movement and part of your, part of your business and make sure that, you know, that you, that you do acknowledge that. And thank you very much for, for that because accountability, you know, it's, it's one thing to leave a review because I, I don't think people just leave a review and expect that they get something back. So that's right. the cool part is that you can go beyond their expectations and really say, you know, that really does help us out a lot. And then it's an opportunity for education for other clients to say, oh, that they do like that. That, that really does help them. So why don't I, I can do that. That's easy. Let me, let me put a review. Yeah. yeah. You know exactly. what? Here's something, here's something for you, Nicole. So, you know, we have some great clients that Angela has been doing for 15 years or more. And, you know, when you talk about reviews, we've been really lucky. We've won a few awards in some local magazines and we've been in a lot of salon trades. Um, most recently, we're part of the Salon Today 200, which are the top 200 salons in the country uh, for our philanthropy that we do with our Sustainable Beauty Week event, which we'll talk about next week a little more in detail. Uh, but some of our clients come in and say, wow, I, I never wrote a review for you guys. Just tell me what you want me to say. I'll write it. And it's like, <laughs> I would prefer it to be genuine. You know, she's been doing your hair for 15 years and, you know, you've definitely been one of our first adopters of the new salon, but well, what's a good way to, to encourage some of, because I know a bad review is somebody leaves right away and they have a bad experience. They're like, you know, they're venomous at that point. The fans are out, they're in the car on Yelp and they're ready to go. But what about your good clients? What's a great way to get them to, to encourage them to do it? Um, well, I just want to make a point too about that negative reviews are still okay um, because as long as you own what happened and you try and fix it, then most people understand that we're human and there's human error. So even if you get a bad review that that's okay and as long as you respond to it professionally and own whatever it was that happened, whether it was a mistake of your team, um, you know, we're more than happy to have you come back in and make this better for you then that's okay. But for trying to get a review, um, for people who don't really know what to say, um, you know, it's just ask them exactly, um, well, why do you come here? If your friends, if, if you said uh, for, for that client that you've been doing possibly for 15 years and they're like, oh, I'd like to review, I don't know what to say, and say, well, why do you come here? Why are you still coming to me after all of this time? Is it because I'm great? I'm the person. Is it because of your experience? And get them talking about it and go, there you go. There's your review. And you can do that while they're in the chair. Or if you're, you know, say, hey, why don't you just come on Facebook and you can ask me what you want to write. Um, shoot me a message. And I'll let you know if that's okay. But um, mostly, a lot of people are scared to put um, write online because it's there and they're like, oh, I don't want to sound stupid or I don't know if, you know, it'll make me how it'll make me look. And it's you just got to get them comfortable. And that's why when you ask them for it, you can actually have that discussion of, yeah, if you're here, you know, send me a review. Hi. <laughs> hey, how's it going? You're you're on Ailes, you're on Ailes account and uh, you don't look like Ayla. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you get to hear it. It's, it sounds like Minnie yeah. Mouse on your, I guess Alvin and Mike. On your yeah, recording. Yeah, I, I got Alvin. Yeah, I, I did too. It, um, so I guess for anybody on the call, that's, um, that's Ayla Cobb, who's the education manager for Davinus North America. And that's Dax Anderson, one of the educators. They're out of the class with Joseph DiMaggio now. Hopefully they try to jump back on. Um, <laughs> it's just funny to see a guy. Might it's like Curtis, the same thing, like a guy with a beard jumping on a call with the Mickey Mouse voice, it's sort of like, I was tempted to just leave them on like that, but let's see if they're able to get back in for, uh, for the end of the call to, to jump on and, um, and talk a little about some products and some things that they're up to. But uh, I'm sorry, Nicole, so go ahead. So bad That's reviews, okay. bad reviews or reviews. Yeah, I mean, and, um, and there's gonna be people who just don't wanna leave a review, but that's okay. Um, there's also the people who are old school and they'll send you a card. Yeah. 
which you can display, you can put on your website. For some of my clients, the ones that get the cards in because their clients are older and not online, yeah. we actually just have an area on their website for them where they can post all of those ones. What's up, Dax? Let's hear the voice, man. All right. Get- That's better. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. <laughs> all right. Everything was like in slow motion. All I heard was... <laughs> How are you guys doing? We're doing good, man. Well, welcome to the, the movement of sustainable salons. Uh, Dax is one of the educators, one of the high-end educators over for, for Davinus, and he's with Ayla Cobb, as I mentioned. But Dax, where, where are you guys now? We're in Austin right now. Uh, we're prepping for a show for um, Modern Salon, and then we are doing some classes here in Austin for right after, you know, um, to go over modern trends and styling classes for things that we did during Fashion Week. That's cool, man. Listen, uh, we definitely appreciate it. You know you guys are really busy prepping and things today, so we, we definitely appreciate you jumping on. Um, the past few calls, this is our third one. Uh, hopefully you're able to join us at another one for some more time too. But we always like to uh, to hit up some type of product. Uh, what, what's your favorite product, man? What, what's, your, what's your go-to Davinus product? Oh, wow. I mean, they're all so good. The medium, the medium hairspray is amazing. The uh, your the whole your hair assistant line is fantastic. There's not a product in that line that is not a go. See, unfortunately, your hair assistant's sort of like Fight Club right now. None of us have it released yet, so we're we're I don't know I don't know how much we can talk about it. Uh, I, I can I can tell you that we didn't put one in our bag from Los Angeles of the new hairspray, but but since you've been using both lines, why don't you give us a little bit of um, some info like the new your hair assistant hairspray versus the medium hold medium hold is one of my absolute favorites um, for a million reasons. What do you think? Yeah, I mean, the medium hold hairspray, it's, you know, it really has been our go-to for so long. Just, it's completely versatile. You know, we go through cans of it during Fashion Week. I mean, re- we do wait, wait, wait. all of the looks with you it. You recycle them too, right? Just want to make sure. Oh, absolutely. Just want to make sure. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, yeah, we bring all the cans back and recycle everything for sure. Um, the new hair, or the hair assistant hairspray, I mean, it's it's the formulation is equally as good. We're able to just get it in the hair, have the control that we need, much like the medium hairspray. It's really an interchangeable product. We can go either way. Um, it's a, um, I guess the best way to describe it. It's it probably ha- gives us a little bit more control for. Um, for the looks on the runway over the medium hold hairspray just for it has just a little bit more grip but we go back and forth it's so hard to say both products are just so good yeah any uh, any feedback from fashion week this year um i know that you were out there and we saw some great looks that davinus was able to post up on facebook but what would you think this year personally i don't do hair but i thought the looks this year were awesome they were way better than last year even in terms of the designers i feel Thank like the clothes Everything was like, you know, so amped up from last year. I thought it was great. Oh, yeah. Everything was really great. The Mozkov show was really amazing. Um, our lead, Joseph DiMaggio, came up with that look, and it just it just crushed it. Those The designs, the, the clothes were amazing, very simple patterns. Um, we also did a control sector show that was amazing. We did Just Drew. Uh, we did Kayleen. Wow, it's there's just so many. We did over thirty shows this season. Wow! wow. So I mean, yeah. it was a complete whirlwind of logistics on top of just doing hair and coming up with looks and organizing product. I mean, Davines was so amazing. They sent us pallets of product. Oh, wow. I mean, we went through I don't know a hundred to almost two hundred um, volumizing mousse jars i mean we just i mean hairsprays the whole thing the your hair assistant um primer on everything it was amazing we were just had we have the best support from davines it's just the it makes you know doing those that many shows so much better and easier when you have that kind of proper support now that's awesome man we'll, we'll definitely have to jump on you know um so foundationally with the sustainable salon movement things that we're working on you know, products play a big thing. I know Joseph likes to have his secret test kitchen where he mixes, makes his concoctions of products that hopefully we can talk about cocktailing 
Um, but we, we'd love to have you guys go to come back on um, together too to talk a little bit about session work and love that some of the stylists that are on it and what it entails. I think sometimes you know some can look at it from afar and say, "Hey, I love what they do," and I'm completely fine behind my chair with what I do. And other ones, the younger stylists, say, "Hey, I'd love to do it." That right. it's a huge undertaking. So I, I definitely commend you guys. Thirty shows, man, ah, a short time. It's it, it's a big yeah. It's it was a big undertaking, but you know this is what we do. I mean, this is why we train. Um, even though you know we all have our things that we do, we're constantly training and pushing ourselves and really setting those goals to kind of you know reach that next plateau or that next level of our. Um, you know where we want to be and what we want to do so it's just like anybody else we're just constantly pushing ourselves yeah you know next call though i think either you or curtis it's only one or the other because i have a little beard envy you know <laughs> <laughs> and you know I'm, I'm pretty happy with the way my yeah. beard's looking at the moment joseph just gave me a trim thanks that's <laughs> okay that's why we like oh that's that's not fair <laughs> yeah i know this is really the first time i've had a chance to look at it i'm like oh, okay good <laughs> <laughs> so, so Dax, that was a really good point that you're talking about it for accountability wise, because, you know, that's what our call is about is accountability. And it, it takes a lot of it, it, accounting and accountability, but it takes a lot of um, different perspectives on that, depending on what you what you are as a stylist. Some people are salon owners, some people are stylists, some people are session stylists. But, you know, it is something that you always have to take stock of or where you're at in your career and have a plan. How do you how do you map out your plan of being able to budget your time and your investment? Because you must have clients, you know, right? I, I don't. I do do some private clients, but I really don't work in a salon anymore. Um, Davines um, and Joseph, they both kind of keep me busy and uh, on the road. I'm, I'm constantly on the road. Budgeting the time, though, you know, it's always a juggle because I have a family. And I want to spend as much time with my family and my daughter and my wife as I possibly can. But then, you know, we also set our career goals. So, mm -hmm. you know, you just kind of have to keep those bubbles. What's, you know, what are the important things? And for me, um, I like working with my family because that's what we are. When we're on the road together, we travel together, we live together, you know, we're around each other 24 seven. So if we don't have that family connection, and are able to, you know, work and share ideas and push each other. We're constantly pushing each other. I mean, we get frustrated with each other just like any other family. And, you know, it's a very real relationship. So, you know, that's important for me and that's kind of how I, you know, keep it all going. But when I'm at home, I'm focusing on my daughter and my wife and that kind of thing. And when we're working, it's all in. So, uh, you know, hopefully I, that was a, I was able to answer that question. Yeah, well, what I'm hearing is is that you just know your priorities, and um, you know you really at least are thinking through those priorities in your life. And you know, even though the career is a massive, important thing that supports your family um, to be able to do it, but you know, you're doing what you love as well. But you know, you're putting that within a priority sequence that that shows what you're investing on for your time and energy. Yeah, you have to. You have, you have to. I mean, you know, we're all humans, and we all have goals, but. Um you know, we all have to kind of keep that balance to keep sanity going, you know? <laughs> yeah. Otherwise, you know, it's just madness, especially with the workload that we kind of carry around. I mean, we are on the last year, I think we were on the road 47 weekends out of the year. So wow. it's wow. really intense. Yeah, it's really intense. You know, for me, it's, you know, I still want to be at my daughter's parent teacher conference. So sometimes I'm, you know, flying in from another place just for a 30 minute elementary school meeting, you know, so it's, uh, it's definitely has its moments. So that's, that's awesome. So how, how do you, how do you keep up with social media Dax, while you're doing, do you have an assistant that does social media for no, you? Or what's, what's I do all my own social media. Joseph does all his social media. We all kind of balanced it out. Um, you know, I just use Instagram at the moment. I, I, I am on Facebook, but Everything goes through Instagram, the images and little videos. I can't speak, you know, it's just a perfect platform. Yeah. So we just do, we just do that. And, um, you know, we have just massive support from um, those images and people following us. So that's, that's really what we do. And we can make comments and tag everybody from our team. I mean, this year we had a 30 plus person team 
So, you know, we have to make sure everybody gets on with everybody's um, the right hashtags and mm-hmm. everybody's liking everybody's photos so that the network can really expand. Yeah, that's great. Nicole, do you have any advice with regards to Instagram versus Facebook Um, marketing? No, like Instagram is huge because especially because your business is so visual, a picture is worth a thousand words. That's why it's taken off so well. It's going to be bigger than Facebook probably because everyone can do it. You don't have to, like your grandma can do it. (laughs) You know, she gets what the pictures are and the video just enhances it. And it's all about just exactly if you have unique hashtags for your business, for your salon, make sure you're using those and, you know, let your community know that's what the hashtag is that they're supposed to use. Tag your people. They're part of your team and they're part of your family, you know, and there's only two to three degrees of separation in the world right now. So you have a huge network at your fingertips and it's just people need to hear about you to know about you. And if they know, uh, like what they see, they're going to look into you more. So it's just about consistent posting and just actually taking the time to do it. That's really a great point. Consistency is everything. I mean, that's kind of what we are always talking about between our team. Like really keep consistent posts going, consistent mm-hmm. images. So that's that was that's a huge key part. And there's so many. I love to hear that that's. Oh, sorry. I was just going to say there's so many cool things you can do for salon owners. Like you can do the time lapse of your haircuts or you can do colors, time lapse colors and, you know, just really cool little videos and pictures with uh, collages. There's so many really cool things that you can do to get people's attention now. So it's it's incredible how you can showcase your work. That's- yeah. And it's, it's really authentic, too, I think, with, with regards to Instagram. It's it's. It is a little bit, you know, personal and it's, you know, mobile. So people can be on their phones anywhere all the time. So a shout out for Dax. Um, his Instagram is hair by Dax, that's right, right? That's right. Awesome. So follow him on Instagram and see what he's up to this weekend. And um, uh, we all have Instagram. Uh, Nicole, of course, do you have Instagram? I don't, I don't even know if you have Instagram. I do. Um, it's just my I'm personal sure. Instagram. So I'm just at, yeah. I can put a, I'm at, uh, yeah, put a link on the side there for us. Um, we have also the movement, the salon movement uh, has an Instagram as well. So um, I'm not sure if you're following us or not, Dax. But no, um, I will. I, uh, okay, and uh, so we'll we'll make sure to keep on following your stuff and reposting it and, and staying connected. Right. These are ways that we can stay connected in between all these calls and and support each mm-hmm. other. So and uh, thanks for coming on here and doing this. James, you guys, James and Angela, you guys are getting Instagram yeah, today, right? Yeah, absolutely. No, no, I, you know, it's funny. <laughs> we, we have our Instagram. We're at beehive organic for the salon. Uh, but definitely appreciate connecting with you guys and hopefully to follow you on Instagram and see some of the crazy things that you post up there, Dax. Yeah, that's uh, awesome. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. The, the time lapse thing, man. I think that's your next thing. I think you should do that today. That would be pretty cool. <laughs> I know we're actually, um, you know, I don't know how much time we'll have today. We've got uh, a lot of still a lot of prep to do and get models going. But um, if we can get it going, if I can get somebody to help me out, we'll try to do something. Awesome. Listen, Dax, I really appreciate the time. Hopefully we get you on another call with some of the team as well. Thank you so much for taking time out. We love that. Thank thank you guys for having me. We really appreciate it. And um, I look forward to talking to you guys again sometime. Thanks, Dax. Thanks again. All right, bye. Bye Thanks a lot. All right, bye. Nicole, thanks to you too. Um, definitely want to get you on a separate call, just specifically on social media and some things. And you know, we'll post some things about your company up on the salon movement if anybody um, needs some expert advice. And, and hopefully, you have a nice visit when you see Curtis on Tuesday at Design House. Yeah. And, you know, <laughs> take a little spray funny. bottle and yeah. take the spray bottle and give a little love to the living wall they have in there while you're at the shop. Yeah, I, I'm kind of feeling like yeah, a we should, shopper. We yeah, we should we should do that. That's a great idea, James. We're gonna put a you know give love to the living wall, so it, it's uh, so our assistant has less work to do on spraying it every you know two hours. People can just come in and be their own, do their own gardening. Um, yeah, thanks thanks Cole for coming in. I know that you had a few more things that you want to talk about too. We want to try to keep yep, this call to cool. you know around the whole point, but um, I'm gonna post um, your comments in on the right hand side for um, messages and we're also going to do a um, you know if you want to do a quick page or your little write down of things I'll send it over in the email as as uh, to our members as some as some uh, key things to think about for social media 
And um, thanks so much for being a sustainable partner. Yeah, well, thanks so much for having me. And I loved hearing about what you guys are doing. And, you know, just um, so many of the things that you do do are transferable. And some of the comments you made about accounting and accountability, I mean, that that's for a lot of businesses, not just the hair um, industry. So it was I learned a lot, too. <laughs> so thank you for that. Thank you, Nicole. Great to have you. And like Great. I said, we will get you on. We'll, we'll have a, a definite social media focus on one of these calls, and we'd love to have you back as a guest again. Thank you. Thanks. We'll have a great weekend, you guys. You too. <laughs> Thanks, Nicole. Cool. Yeah. All right, my friend, Curtis, thank you as always. Um, you know, everybody that's on that's, that's either watching now or, or going to watch the replay, uh, we'll be back next Sunday at 1 p.m. Eastern for our final kickoff month call. Um, you know, we'd love to have um, a huge showing for our last one for the month. And, you know, this week we'll put a calendar up on, on the salonmovement.com. Anybody that hasn't checked out the site or signed up, please do. Remember that Neil Dukoff from Strategies is offering a complimentary consultation with anyone that's part of the movement until March 15th. So, Got a little less than 30 days to do that. And any salon owners that, on, that are on today, um, definitely send us a message. We're going to raffle off one of his awesome books. Um, it's got topics from marketing to training to your profit and loss. Um, I, I wish I had a real copy here, but it's funny. It's right next to my desk in the salon. So um, it's definitely an important book. And, and Curtis and I are going to have the luxury of hopefully presenting with Neil at some point this summer at Art of Business. Um, but but I'm done. Great to have you, Curtis. Any any final thoughts? Um, I I would say the only thing is that just remember to to everybody out there that uh, it's important to have balance, you know, in everything that you're doing with accounting and accountability. You know, it, it's important to look at these numbers and it's important to do these things. Um, but you know, make it a priority in your life for sure. But don't make yourself you know don't shame yourself or guilt yourself into this situation. That's not what we're talking about. Do your passion. Um, outsource what you don't like um, so that you know other people have opportunity to assist you and be part of your team to be cooperatively invested in your success and you know in your balance in your life to being able to when it's time not to be thinking about the salon and about your numbers and about marketing and about being behind the chair because you're doing all these things and, and you're being proactive in your business rather than reactive then you can just rest and think about the things that are like what Dax is saying priorities in your life like family and you can be fully present with your spouse or with your family member or for your TV show or whatever your glass of wine or whatever you're doing at that time and not be haunted by the things that you, sh you should be doing or haven't done yet in the salon. So just as a as an encouragement out there for everybody, um, just keep going. We're going to help each other through this. We're, we're going to make it so that the number of profitability or salons that are profitable in the, move, the salon movement is 100% and that's that's a minimum, not uh, not our not our goal. So um, yeah, if you reach out to us, give us some ideas for the show. Visit our website for some more tools in the future. And uh, this is a great call. Thanks so much, guys. It's really good, good to see you. see you. Thanks, Curtis. Hey, everybody, be cool. We'll see you next Sunday. Thanks, Curtis. Okay. See you guys.